down the hallway on the 23rd floor of a skyscraper downtown, and I'm on the way to my first annual review, and I'm not feeling good about it. I've only been in this role for a year, and I know I'm the slow one on the team, and the others are known to be the heroes who get things done and know how to solve problems and fix things. And so as I go in and talk to the partner about my year and my projects, we talk about my role and the different things that have happened all year, and then she takes a deep breath and she says, Angela, the leaders and I love the questions you ask. You're the only one that consistently asks about the big picture, the customer experience, and the users. I kind of fake my way smiling through this conversation with a bit of confusion at this point, but I needed the compliment. And she continues on and says, I want you to continue to develop these skills and set the example for the others. And at this point, I'm totally confused inside. I've been doggy paddling my way through this job for a year, knowing I'm the slowest one on the team, trying to keep my head above water. Everyone else is far more technical than me, far more superior, and they are the heroes. I'm so confused. What do my leaders want? I don't know if this business analyst thing is the right role for me. And so I think about this for days, and then it hits me. What I'm doing is valuable, and I need to change. I need to make a transition in my career. I need to change my mindset. I need to build my confidence and set the example for others. And I need to learn as much as I can about this business analyst thing. Like, learn all the skills and practices and what this is all about. The following year, I was promoted and asked to lead the requirements best practices and given a team to do research on what the most successful projects were doing. And we built an entire requirements practice for a very large organization after studying thousands and thousands of projects across the globe. I really hope today they're still not using those practices. <laughs> that was a long time ago. <laughs> but like I was at a crossroads trying to figure out what business analysis meant to me and my organization, I know many of you are there as well. We have digital, agile, and all kinds of changes still coming we might not even know about. And this role is completely changing. We're valuable and we have to adapt. Angela, thank you for opening up to the group and kind of setting the mindset that we need for today and where we want to take you. Now, I want to open up a little to you guys. Uh, I was planning on wearing a red dress today, um, and Angela shows up. So luckily, I brought extra clothes. Um, so today, we, what we want to share with you is the state of Agile Analysis 2019, and it's the results from a research project that, at the beginning of the year, Angela had thought up. And she called me and said, Coop, I got this great idea. Don't think there's enough research about analysis and Agile. We should do it. And I was like, uh, yeah, sure. And I'm a, an improv artist, so the first thing I always say is yes, end. But <laughs> We don't have time to do this. When are we going to get it done? But we decided it was worth it, and we wanted to move forward. So why, why do we need the research? So Angela and I, just like a lot of you, follow different Agile surveys that are out there and, and read them every year. Version 1, or CollabNet version 1, I think they're up to the 15th uh, state of Agile survey. Um, but we didn't think any of these surveys were going deep enough into analysis. And Angela and I, and probably a lot of you, have always felt that business analysis definitely adds value. 
people that play the BA role, like you guys, we add value to teams, but it was all anecdotal. There was no data behind that to say, yes, there, here's proof that what BAs do and having BAs adds value to the team. So we were like, we want to have data to kind of show this. So with a research project, uh, we hired a third party research consultant who guided us through the process. And one of the first things she said is, well, what's your research question? And I said, well, I want to know that BAs on an agile team are providing value and making a difference. And then there's some other things I wanted to know. Uh, do BAs in management and team members think of success differently? And do certain analysis practices and techniques correlate and have a relationship to better agile success? And uh, so that's where we started with this project and what our initial questions were. And you know, we realized that we might have a bias. I mean, Just we, a little. We, yeah. A little, okay. Uh, we've worked with teams and, uh, and hundreds and hundreds of organizations and, and consistently we ask organizations to measure projects with a BA on them and it's always come out that, yeah, those projects are more successful. At the same time, you can imagine Coop and I are just a little busy. Do we have time to take on this type of project in addition to everything else we're doing? Well, it was very important to us and we wanted the real data. But again, we hired a third party research consultancy to uh, cleanse the data, normalize it, crunch the data, and guide us through the process because we wanted real data and a sound study. Now, for all the geeks out there, 2,300 pivot tables with statements about the results were returned to me. So uh, Wednesday night, Chicago PD, Fire Medical PD, I looked at all 2,300, sent Coop a text and was like, <laughs> watch out. Here we go. <laughs> well, luckily Angela did a lot of that because I have dyslexia and looking at all that, those numbers was making me dizzy. Yeah, it made me dizzy too. I seem to uh, look at them better with a glass of wine. Um, <laughs> so. And we know we're in between this talk and wine, so we're, we're going to get here. We're, we're getting to the heart of the matter. Here we go. So what did we find? Well, the first thing we found, which was very refreshing, is that consistent with other Agile research and what other successful research gets with successful Agile teams, we got the same type of things. The same type of results, like the ones on the screen, are what successful teams were telling us were the results that they were getting. And so then we're thinking, well, how can we figure out how effective analysis practices uh, contribute to this? And how can we uphold the overarching agile values and the demand for speed that we all are getting from our leaders while doing good analysis, right? We don't want to slow everyone down. We don't want to slow the results, yet we need time to do good analysis, right? We also found consistent with other agile industry surveys and research that our survey results were consistent with the agile values. So teams that have limited work in progress, face-to-face -face collaboration, co-location, 100% dedicated, full stack backlog items, and automated testing were indeed performing with better results in our research as well as the others in the industry. So we felt good that we had a good sample set that was consistent, and next, we just had to dig into the analysis pieces. Right, this was table stakes. So now we're getting into the meat of what we wanted to get to. We validated, we're in line with other surveys. Now the meat of analysis. So this is, this is the part where uh, we've been holding back on this information. Some of you might have heard that other information before, but here today we promised Ken Fulmer and the IIBA we would not share any of the results. Um, so it was like ripping out of our chest. We wanted to talk, we've been talking to you guys for the last couple of days and we wanted to share it, but we promised we'd hold on to it. So, I mean, it's pretty exciting. So if I can get a drum roll, please, you guys do that for me, right? Come on, I see you out there slapping. All right, Angela, what does it say? I didn't expect laughter from that coup. Yeah, I thought there would be some crying and running to the bar. First, yeah, so having a BA on the team is not making a difference in teams that report success 
with Agile. So just a BA on the team actually has, the way the data showed, it has a negative relationship to teams having success. Yeah. Yikes. Yeah, that feeling you have, imagine how we felt. Mm. I got a call from Nina, a research consultant, early in. She had weeks left before getting us our data results. She says, Angela, I don't know if you want me to even continue working on this. What? And so I, I called Coop, called Ken Fulmer, and he doesn't know anything else about this, by the way. It's all new to him, the rest of it. No? Right. <laughs> but anyway, it was quite a moment where we were just devastated because, of course, we're believers in the value of a BA. We believe in the BA role and the BA skill set. How can this be different? We've always been a valuable role to our teams. What are the changes we need to make? Hang on, BAs. So, so this was the point where Angela and I had to sit back and say, okay, having a BA on the team, that layer of data, shows it adds no value. It's actually negative results. More teams without are doing better reporting success, right? So, so we had to dig deeper and take layers down, so we started peeling the onion about BAs on teams. And here's what we started to find out. So one, having a BA that is dedicated 100% to a team is making a difference in teams reporting success. So if you're 100% dedicated to the team, then there's success. So not just having a BA on the team, but now we go, when they're dedicated, now we go into the positive side where there's success. And I have to give this example to make sure we're clear on what 100% dedicated means. And there's actually some people here today that I'm, we work together, so uh, none of you in the room actually said this, so <laughs> I'll tell you later if you want to know. But I'm working with this client, and. Uh, working with one of the managers and I said, hey, we want to talk about this new model we're going forward with with dedicated teams. And this person's like, oh yeah, Coop, we're already there. We have dedicated teams. People are dedicated to teams. I'm like, so explain to me what that means. Like, oh yeah, all of our team members are 50% dedicated to this team and 50% dedicated to this team. 100%. Do the math. Right? And they're, they're in the actuarial department. So I was like, okay, I can't argue the math, but that's not what I'm talking about, right? It's people, the BA on the team, fully dedicated to whatever work that team is doing, they're on that team and only that team, okay? So this is now making movement towards success with business analysis. So what's next? So then we looked at the partnership between the business analyst and product owner when there were both, when there weren't both, how did they interact? And what came out, the highest results or the strongest relationships to success was when a BA on the team partnered very closely with the product owner on the team. When they were in lockstep, helping each other out, where the PO might, and this is our insight, the PO might be spending more time in the business, but then working with the BA to help break stuff down, help with prioritization things that you guys already do. So this works better than having no PO at all and only a BA. So, and we work with teams all the time that have a BA, but they're not the product owner. And then the product owner, but no business analyst on the team. So this is a good sign. So the other thing that worked out well was a BA as the PO. All right, so it was someone with BA skills but is now the product owner. So a lot of you might play the proxy product owner. Do some of you play that role? Do we have that term still out there? Yes, yeah, so a lot of you play the proxy product owner. Now, typically, when I hear that phrase, proxy product owner, doesn't, it means you don't have decision-making authority for the team. You just have to run back all the time to get information and get buy-in from the product owner. This, the insight we're taking is when there's success, the BA actually has decision-making authority. 
Okay, next was the skill set and capabilities of the BA and the product owner. So now we're seeing some results. It's like, okay, if there's a dedicated BA, if the BA has a strong partnership with the product owner, now what else? There was different layers going on within the BAs and product owners. And we found that teams that have formally trained product owners and BAs in their specific roles and the, the skills that they need, then there's a strong relationship to success. If there is no training or maybe some internal training that teams are trying to do, or just general training like certified scrum master training or safe training, I'm not saying that stuff is bad, but that's not the, the training we found is adding the value. The training is how does the BA and the PO interact on a day-to-day -day basis together. So this is showing that you are valuable. We are valuable. We just need to change and start to operate a little differently. Mm -hmm. So let's get into what BAs actually do on the team. Yes. So of course the next question you might be thinking is, okay, great. Now what do I do when I'm on the Agile team to add value? So we looked at this, and these are the top five things reported by teams that BAs do on the Agile team. No surprises here, right? Write user stories, write acceptance criteria, talk to users, answer questions, and write requirement specs. Yeah, that was the interesting one for us. It was, because these are the, the most frequently reported things BAs do on Agile teams. Okay. So more than 50% of teams said BAs are writing requirement specs. How many of you are writing requirement specs as part of an Agile team? Okay, how many of you are not writing requirement specs as part of an Agile team? Ooh, got a little, little yeah, different sway here right, in the yeah. room. I'll say it's 50-50. Yeah, but yeah, you know what, there were people that didn't respond, and I'm gonna say they're too young to remember what requirement specs are. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> I think we're starting to get up yeah. there, you know? Um, yeah, when I started calling, you know, people that are graduating college, I call them kids. I know I've <laughs> kind of gone over the threshold. I know, right? I, I, when I do my training, um, oftentimes I'll get someone in the room who's, who's extremely young and just starting out their BA career, and they'll raise their hand and go, I don't understand, what's a BRD? What's a requirement spec? Seriously, and they've maybe been on the job a couple of years as a BA. Well, this isn't the whole picture because what it made us think about is, okay, so if this is what BAs on Agile teams are doing, let's filter out the teams that are actually successful in Agile. So now we've filtered for what are the top five things BAs do on the teams reporting Agile success. Now, reporting Agile success means things like they actually said, yes, we're getting speed better speed, we're getting better relevancy, better customer satisfaction, better innovation, and better cost. So on seven different success and result levers, they were all moving in a stronger relationship direction to success and in quite a large way with these activities over the others. Guess which activity had the lowest relationship to success? Did we foreshadow? I think they might have yeah, got I think, it. I've heard a couple of people say <laughs> requirement specs. Yeah. yeah. So imagine that. The lowest correlation, not correlation, relationship to, uh, to the Agile reporting success teams was writing requirement specs. So hopefully you have this data, you can bring it back to your leaders if you feel like you're being, like, you know, strung down to write those, right? The other uh, notable item that was showing a very weak relationship to success was when BAs were asked to code and configure on the team. <laughs> right, okay. Some of this isn't so surprising, right? right? So there's all these great valuable things we're doing and some things we can change. Okay, so now we jumped into techniques. The analysis test, so those were the activities that BAs were doing and the successful teams, the techniques that they were doing. Now we wanted to talk about the analysis techniques that are most used by Agile teams. Right? Just the team in general, not the BAs. And this is what we're finding. So the top four is not too surprising, but when we got to requirements workshops, that made us think too. Like, 
how are they running these requirements workshops? You know, and this is where we started. We did the correlation. It didn't really show in the data, but correlation between you ran a requirements workshop to do what? Write a requirements <laughs> spec, right? So we're like, okay, so is that what these requirements workshops, is that what they're doing? Um, are they doing requirements walkthroughs where they're going through that spec? and line by line getting buy-in from everybody or thinking they're getting buy-in for that? Right, it's like there's ends of a spectrum on requirements workshops, right? And on the one end, you have teams that are writing a requirement spec in the workshop, projecting it on the screen, and typing word by word together. On the other end of a spectrum, we have teams that are doing visual modeling, huddles around whiteboards, innovation games, collaborative games, and having deep conversation and analysis dialogue as a team. So now we did the same thing we did with activities we did with techniques, right? So these are what the teams are using most or say they're using most, but then let's filter out just the teams that are showing that success. What are they doing? And here's what we have. So for Angela and I and some of you, uh, this isn't too surprising, right? This is what you have been training, what you have been doing and implementing on your teams. Hypotheses and experimentation, collaboration, innovation games, customer journey map, user story journey maps, brainstorming, business model canvas, acceptance criteria. These are the things that the successful agile teams are doing. Now what with the next layer that we took here Oh, so this, this goes back to requirements workshops, right? Yeah. Requirements workshops was actually the lowest. Similar to requirements specs, requirements workshops had the most negative relationship between success or people, what people used and success. Yeah, that's what really got us to dig into what's a requirements workshop. We've seen that data. Right. And then now we asked, okay, so here are the techniques that are being used on teams. Are BAs on these teams? Right, back to the whole BA question. And for the most part, you can feel good about this, like collaboration, innovation games down, primarily, for the most part, was close to 50-50, right? There were BAs on a lot of those teams. But the teams that use hypothesis and experimentation had very little statistically, very low numbers of BAs on those teams. This is an opportunity, isn't it? Absolutely, right? This is where you're valuable, right? You add value. We're showing that you're adding value, but you have to change. You can't do the same techniques that you've been doing for the last 5, 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about user stories for a minute. You know, they showed up on the most commonly used techniques, the most commonly performed activities for BAs, but we didn't see them on either list of the most impactful activities and techniques successful teams are using. So this made us scratch our heads quite a bit as well and say, wait a second. And Angela, I will say we got nervous because just yesterday we had already planned to do a user story workshop and now our data was saying <laughs> teams aren't using user stories that are showing success. So it was like, oh yeah. crap, do we even do that workshop? Yeah. Right. Yeah, but that, that was like a, a, a <laughs> flutter moment until we looked at the data a little more. Uh, yes, um, so user stories, what is it about them? We talked about it a little bit and again kind of had some insights from our own experience that perhaps teams were not doing user stories correctly in enough volume to create them to float to the top of the most successful techniques on the teams that are getting awesome results. And so we thought, well, what, what data do we have to, to even see if that hypothesis is true? So back on the phone with Nina. <laughs> and so we had some really, really interesting stuff we found with this, and this is just a small snippet of data you'll find in our 24-page survey report that you'll be able to download. So if you take all teams surveyed, if you look at faster speed to market and better relevancy, we have 33 and 43 percent of teams reporting that result of all teams surveyed. Now if you get, let's say, teams using user stories, the number goes up to 38 and 49. That's a pretty good jump saying, 
hey, user stories are, are making a difference. Not a huge difference, but they are making a positive difference. Now here's where it gets interesting. Now we filter out for teams using user stories and have a backlog with 75% of their backlog items as full stack items. What do I mean by that? Full stack meaning user stories or backlog items written from a user point of view that cuts through the entire technical stack, front end, back end, infrastructure, everything, and that way it's demoable and feedbackable for users as a backlog item individually. The numbers get better, 47 and 54. Okay, let's add something else. Now let's say user, um, teams are using user stories, full stack backlog items, and story mapping, user story mapping. Boom, the numbers get even better. Okay, let's add one more. Customer journey mapping. And the numbers get even stronger. I don't know about you, but to see numbers in the 60s or upper 60s percentile of teams reporting success with this type of pattern of technique usage, this is awesome. All right. This and is I, great. I think the summary of a lot of this is that it's not one thing. It's not the fact that you're using user stories. And by the way, in the survey, you don't see JIRA as the number one reason for teams having agile success. Anybody, <laughs> right? That seems to be a reason we have to get JIRA because we're agile now, right? Um, but I bet JIRA does these things at, I'm sorry, Atlassian, the company that that uh, builds that Jira. That builds Jira, right. But it's not one thing. It's not just user stories. It's not just customer journey map. It's not just being 100% dedicated on the team. It's this collection of stuff, these trends that we're seeing. If you start to, start to implement those, then you're going to start seeing success. Mm-hmm. So out of the details, back up to the big picture, we also looked at some common product owner, business analyst things that we do, like creating a product vision creating a product roadmap, not a technical roadmap, a product roadmap, and then having customer-aligned behavior metrics to that roadmap and vision. All three of those items checked off a significant relationship to success on all of our levers of speed, relevancy, quality, teamwork and morale, customer satisfaction, innovation, and cost. It's powerful stuff. Mm. All right, so that was the results we wanted to share so far. Now, you guys, a lot of you might have been every other seat, but a lot of you have this card close by, right? If you don't have the card, you can read a lot of stuff. But on that card has where you can go to download the uh, the survey results, the re research report. It's 24 pages, like Angela was saying early, so it's a lot of detail, a lot of stuff built into that. But what we want you guys to do now is take 90 seconds. So everybody has this card, or you guys can read the things up there so you can write them down or think about them, because we want you to take away some thoughts about what you're going to do tomorrow. So 90 seconds. Go ahead. Thank you. Take 90 seconds, and I want you to write down all of these things. So one thing that surprises you, something you'll focus on as an Agile BA and a technique that you need to learn. So go ahead and write those down. You can do them on your phone, paper. Anybody have pen and paper anymore? Is that a thing? <laughs> All right, Angela, looks like a lot of people over here are, do you want a card? Here, you can have mine. It was $5. I got, I got some folks uh, working on it over here. This is awesome. We're going to get some good stuff out of here. Yeah, we got some folks are writing down. It's funny, it's like the back of the room is working harder than the front of the room, though. Oh, no, my front of the room is kicking butt over here. <laughs> All right, so that's about good time. So now what we want you to do, you have a few of those things. I want you to find somebody two seats away from you. And I know there's gaps. So find someone two seats away from you. You're going to have a minute to share what you wrote down and the thoughts that you have. Okay? A minute to share. Find someone behind you, around you. Yeah, introduce yourself. It's about networking, connecting. Got to practice those networking skills for the happy hour next, right? All right. 
it's too difficult, you could stay together. It's up to you. Oh, you know each other? Right. All right, 30 seconds, so you should be switching if, if you haven't switched already. Okay, clap three times if you can hear me. Clap three times if you can hear me. Clap three times if you can hear me. All right, works with five-year-olds and not so five-year-olds. All right, yeah. All right, so who has, just by raise of hands, who has something that their partner shared with them that they just loved? They thought it was, wow, really cool. Did you guys talk to each other, right? But just raise your hand, who has, something that they love. You got, you half love it? You kind of like it. Okay, if you like it, raise your hand. All right, so Brandy, would you mind sharing? I don't mind sharing. Okay, awesome, go ahead. It was amazing to, for her to basically say what surprised her. And what surprised her was the fact that um, projects run more smoothly whenever you have a product owner and a business analyst on a project. Ah, okay, so she was, it was hard to, at least I couldn't hear too well, but it was, you were surprised that the note about having a BA and the partnership with the product owner yielded better results. Right, okay, good, good finding. Angela, you have one over there? Yes, we do. So my, my partner shared that one thing that surprised her was the success rates and how they were somewhat indifferent regarding whether or not these teams had a business uh, analyst on them. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, the success rates are really interesting. Can you repeat that, Angela? It was hard to, hard to hear. Oh, she was saying about the success rates with and without a BA, a dedicated BA, and that surprise. And it's just an opportunity, too, to share that the presentation here doesn't have a lot of the, the detailed data points, but the report download has 24 pages and tons of information we can't fit into this presentation. So you'll see a lot of the detailed data for the data nerds and just good data and other factoids altogether about this research, so. Right, okay, well thank you guys for sharing. So Angela and I do want you to know we were here sponsoring and we host an online platform called BA Cube. And we built it because we wanted you guys to be learning every year, every month, every week, every hour, every minute if you want right, when you want. So we have memberships from free to not so free, depending how far you want to go and how much you want to learn. So please feel free to check that out. We'd love to see you online and continue this conversation. So it's the summer of 1999. And Prince has been telling me to party like it's 1999, but I haven't been. I've been working night and day, weekends, and it all started because eight months prior, I was recruited to a team that was supporting the Atlanta sports teams. So the Atlanta Hawks, Atlanta Thrashers, or the Atlanta Hawks, Atlanta Braves, and the new franchise, our hockey team, the Atlanta Thrashers. And I was recruited to the team because earlier in my IT career, I was having success. And now I'm a big sports fan, so I'm going to work on a team that is helping our sports teams in Atlanta. I jumped in with both feet. I thought it was the best thing possible. And the first few projects on this team, I also had success and things were going well. So I was put in charge to lead uh, the website for the Atlanta Thrashers. Now we're about two months out from them opening their first season and we're building a website and I'm overwhelmed my team is overwhelmed, we're working all the time, we are just way in over our heads. Because at the time, 1999, if you could believe it, it's early in the days of websites, and we were being pushed 
by our business partners and the marketing team for the Thrashers to do some really cool bleeding edge stuff on the website. So we're going through all this and right about, you know, we're in the heat of the moment and my manager says, Coop, we need to go have some coffee to talk about the project. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. We're so far behind, I'm working all the time. The last thing I need is to sit around and talk about the project and just drink coffee. But I, I went and we had a conversation about what's going well, what's not going so well. And then she says, Coop, you, you had success earlier in your career. You even had success on some of the teams working with me. Do you really know what you're doing? Or has it all been luck? Uh, you're laughing? That, I, I'm, I'm a kidder, but oh my god, that was like a serious gut punch, right? Like, I, I thought I was successful, and now I'm being told it's, it's all luck? And the voice in my head is going, you're a failure, you suck, you can't do this, you should have been an accountant like your dad told you to be. And I go through the emotions, you know, the stages of emotions really quick, and I just land right on, on sad. And my eyes just well up with tears. Now, are there any Atlanta folks here? Yeah, we got some Atlanta folks. So, you know allergies are terrible in Atlanta. So I believe I was welling up because of the allergies, but other people have a different opinion. Uh, but it really, it like really hit me. And I had to collect myself. And I think I realized, I realized something in that moment is that I'm valuable and I need to change. So I sat back and I said to Kristen, my manager, I was like, look, I can do this. The team can do this. We just need to step back, come up with a better plan, and move this thing forward. And I learned, that was a learning moment for me about feedback. Because earlier in my career, I was having success. I didn't think I needed anybody to help me, right? So even when I ran into trouble, it was like, I can do this. I can get through it. Uh, and I realized that I had to have more feedback loops with my management team and other people on my team that I just can't do it myself. So I decided to take a growth mindset and use that moment as a learning opportunity and figure out how I can improve. Now you guys, like I think Angela and I, even though a lot of you laughed, I think Angela and I might have delivered a gut punch early on. Like, what are you talking about? BAs aren't showing success on agile teams, right? So you can, you can do two things. You can take more of a fixed mindset and say, well, you know what, I know this, I'm just gonna keep doing it. Or you know what, this agile thing isn't for me, I'm gonna move on and do something else with my career. Or you can use this as a learning moment and say, okay, what can I change? What can I do differently? What can I get started? Now some of you might even be thinking, you know what, I can't do this. I wish my manager was sitting right next to me. They need to hear this. They need to hear that we need to be 100% dedicated on a team and not move me around like crazy. Well, yes, that's true. You can take that attitude and be like, my manager has to hear this, or you can start implementing something. You can push for different things. Some of the techniques we laid out there, you can learn how to use those techniques. You don't have to ask for permission to do that. You can just do it. Yeah, you can. Uh... Ken Fulmer teed us up this morning with his opening about it's all about continuous learning or you're not going anywhere in this field. Right, so I, I wanna end with this, that the website was a success. We did get it launched and it had nothing to do with the failure of the team in Atlanta and they ended up moving to Winnipeg, right? Where are my Winnipeg? Uh, yeah, right. oh, there they are, yeah. So but the website was awesome, although it crashed all the time and I was up late at night early on. But, but it, that's not why they moved to Winnipeg. Just having, having a hockey team in a really hot climate doesn't always work out. That's right. So thank you guys on behalf of Angela and I. Thank, thank you. you guys for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. And time for some yeah. drinks downstairs in the sponsor hall. Libation. We'll be down there to uh, answer any questions that you have. Uh, we do have one fancy glossy printed out copy of the survey report, but again, download it uh, from the uh, address on your card, and we'll see you around the conference and down there tonight awesome. and tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you.